Um, welcome. This webinar is hosted by the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Innovation Network, Quality Improvement Organization for North Dakota and South Dakota. My name is Jennifer Lochner. I'm a Quality Improvement Advisor with Great Plains Quality Innovation Network and Quality Health Associates of North Dakota. I want to thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items to review. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted within one to two business days on our website at greatplainsquin.org. All lines will be muted throughout the presentation, and please add any questions or comments to the chat. We will allow time at the end of the presentation to respond. Thank you for joining our Helping Long-Term Care Residents Keep Their Shine webinar. I had the privilege of hearing Dr. Samford present on this important topic and knew this content and information would be great value for our nursing homes in the Dakotas. I am very excited to learn more. Nearly 37% of adults worldwide have vitamin D levels below the recommended amounts, according to research published in the journal Metabolites. In the US, studies have found that 14% to 18% of adults have low levels of vitamin D. Some people are more at risk for too little intake or absorption of vitamin D, including older adults, specifically those in long-term care facilities. Without enough vitamin D, bones may become weak and brittle over time. Other signs and symptoms of vitamin D deficiency include muscle weakness, fatigue, and a weakened immune system. Some also report changes in their mood and ability to concentrate. If this deficiency is overlooked, these symptoms could lead to further problems, like falls and misdiagnosis, then leading to possible antipsychotic use. Dr. Beth Sanford will share how we can improve resident and patient outcomes throughout a better understanding of vitamin D testing and vitamin D education, and new established guidelines within healthcare communities can establish solid professional preventative practices while addressing a safe, effective, low-cost intervention that can make a big health impact. This webinar is a result of a comment we received from a webinar participant that asked us to provide education on how we can better understand and partner with IHS facilities in the Dakotas. I now have the privilege of introducing our subject matter expert on this topic, Dr. Beth Sanford. Dr. Beth Sanford is a DNP, RN, ACN, CLC professor of nursing, FM, ATI champion, NCLEX coach, doctor of nursing practice in public health and policy, specializing in vitamin D translational research. Dr. Stanford, I will turn it over to you and add any, anything related to your experience and or begin your presentation. Thank you so much everyone for having me here today. It's really exciting. I love to share about vitamin D. Anybody who has heard me speak live knows this is really one of my passions in life. I, I did have the thought the other day that I might need to find some other hobbies because whenever they ask what your hobbies are, I always think, well, reading vitamin D research, of course. I thought, but now it, I have to say, going, I'm going to spend more outside time outside this summer getting vitamin D so I can add that to my profile of hobbies so I'm not just a book nerd, right? But I'm really excited to share what I've learned over the course of doing my doctoral research and even my being able to piece together some of my own experiences in health and my family's health and how that played into vitamin D deficiency in our family. So the purpose really today, like I said, actually tomorrow I'm doing another presentation on vitamin D and childbearing age women. But for this group, I wanted to hone in, of course, on your specialty, which is looking at um, long-term care residents and staff. Because I think if we keep our staff happy and healthy, it will trickle over to help keeping our residents happy and healthy too. I got my start in nursing as an aide. I worked as an aide um, illegally underage because they thought I was 16 and really I was 15. So I worked way over hours as a 15 year old and, and developed a great love for uh, long term care during that time. And I worked as a, an aide in long term talent in long term care until I graduated with my BSN um, in nursing. So I had many many years of being an aide and um, loving long-term care. 
So my inspiration really comes from my family across the lifespan. Uh, this is my daughter, my mother, my grandmother, who just recently passed away in December, and myself all out in the Badlands in Western North Dakota, which was one of our place of our great loves where we love to go get some sunshine. And, and we all have a vitamin D story. And for the, my, for the stories for today that I'll tell, I'll mainly focus on my grandmother and my mother because it's relevant to this population. And so all of you might be a little bit aware, I mean, vitamin D is a lot of times called a hormone, but it's also, also a vitamin and a nutrient, and it's also a cell signaling hormone. So it communicates between cells, um, which is really interesting. They didn't really know that about vitamin D for a long time, um, That it, but it also helps regulate the immune system, I think, which there's more literature coming out about. It prevents tumor growth, so it's actually very important in anti-cancer um, and controlling um, tumor growth and tumor spreading and metastasis. It regulates genes, um, which is really impressive science to look at, is that your, your vitamin D serum level um, will mitigate what how many genes it's upregulating and downregulating. And so it shows that we want to have that robust level so that we're maximizing our gene expression and downregulating when things are triggered and they shouldn't be. Um, it's also part of inflammation, the inflammation process, insulin regulation, so many things. I could do so many presentations on so many topics, but I had to kind of pick and choose um, today for what we're going to talk about. So the body needs vitamin D, all forms of vitamin D. And mainly, of course, uh, we get it from three sources. We get it from the sun, which is our primary source, for from food, which is low in vitamin D, um, and also um, from supplements. Now, most people who know about vitamin B, D metabolism really most of the time talk about the hormonal part of vitamin D, which is um, this part where it's translated into the kidneys. Now, also, vitamin D is where it also is involved with the liver. So this is the part that we measure in the blood, the serum 25 OHD. But a lot of people I found don't understand that vitamin D also acts on peripheral cells directly. So that vitamin D3, it interacts, for example, like in breast tissue directly. It doesn't actually go to the kidney first. It will go right to the organ. And that's something previously that a lot of people didn't know as well. And then also we have D3, um, which is when it comes from the sun, then it's translated into D3. D3 acts specifically on the endothelial lining of arteries. So that's very important in um, proper arterial health and blood clotting, all sorts of things like that. And then also D3 acts itself directly on the skin. So by sunlight hitting the skin, it's translated into D3, which then actually repairs the skin itself. So vitamin D three acts on so many different places in the body previously, I think, which was unknown to many, which showing that it's not just a hormonal form. Sorry, my brain is getting ahead of my mouth today. Um, but talking about food, I think most people will say, oh, I get vitamin D from supplemented dairy. You'd have to have 50 glasses of milk a day to equate to a 5,000 I use supplement. So just to be aware of that, I mean, I don't know many of you, if you want to raise hands that are drinking 50 glasses of milk a day, I mean, I'm definitely not. I would probably keel over dead if I did 50 glasses of milk, um, but even 10 pieces of salmon. Okay, if you think about that, a piece of salmon is about this big. I, I could not eat 10 pieces of salmon a day. It really shows you though, how Arctic populations over time have maintained their D levels because all they were eating was deep sea fish right? That was their main food sources were deep sea fish. Um, and this is how they kept their vitamin D levels high, but most of us are not eating 10 pieces of salmon a day. And of course, in North Dakota, most of us need to supplement if we want to keep a higher vitamin D serum concentration. Um, just a quick summary of some of the literature. Vitamin D deficiency is, of course, very harmful in pregnancy, very harmful um, for maternal health outcomes, um, we see an increase in musculoskeletal disorders, increase in chronic disease, um, increase in non-traumatic acute illnesses, increase in metabolic disorders, increase in cancer and autoimmune diseases, and as well as microbial infections if people have vitamin D deficiency. Now, vitamin D scientists consider vitamin D deficiency to be anything below 20 nanograms per milliliter. Um, insufficiency would be that 20 um, to 30-ish 
Um, vitamin D, there's a panel of 48 vitamin D scientists, um, of which I am affiliated with that group. They recommend 40 to 60, and I will talk about that in a slide or two down the road here. Um, this kind of gives a, a little bit of a brighter indicator there. So we really don't want levels to be under 30, which is kind of the blue. And the green is where we want to be. These would be the higher ranges. So anything above 100. Um, toxicity in the literature is, let me go back here, anything really above around 200, 150. Now, the only reason um, medically that people would be bringing the levels up above 100 is sometimes intentional. So that's using vitamin D, C in a, vitamin D in a pharmaceutical manner. Um, but that's not normal where we're talking about in the normal everyday range. So for this conversation that we're having today, I'm talking about the normal range that we want to have most adults, which is running between that 40 to 60 mark. Um, people with maybe with chronic mental health concerns or people that maybe are even have recently been diagnosed with cancer may be looking in that 60 to 80 range in the literature. But for the most part, most of us are between the 40 and 60. And then again, people with chronic kidney disease, I think they try to keep people around 30 in the literature. So just to give you a reference, that's what I'm going to be talking about during this presentation. So overall, if we look at different serum concentrations of different groups. So they've studied people that live a traditional lifestyle in East Africa. So these people are nomadic tribesmen. So it's from the, Ma the Maasai tribe was one of the tribes that they studied. Their average blood level for adults was about 46 nanograms per mil. So that's kind of right in that green zone that I was mentioning. The average for somebody in the United States, for example, is 26 nanograms per mil. And the community study that we've been doing in North Dakota, our average level is 20 nanograms per mil. So we're even lower than the national average, which of course isn't unreasonable when you think about where we are in latitude in the country, but it does make us be more at risk. Um, for some of these health conditions that we've been talking about. Now, they did a study with lifeguards um, down in the Oceanside area of California, and their average blood levels were also in the 40 to 60 range. And that was even using protective gear, like clothing, hats, and sunscreen. So when sunlight is plentiful, the body will naturally kind of go into that range of that between that 40 and 60. And we have some of the, to the evidence about vitamin D, how the vitamin D works in the body, what will happen when the sunlight is plentiful based on the research that I mentioned. So the traditional lifestyle, the lifeguards, and one of the most impressive research that I read was about the, the kind of tank that we have in our body. So for example, in, in lactating women, you the woman has to have a serum concentration of 50 in order for it to spill out into the breast milk. And so that kind of shows that we all have a tank that needs to be full before we have excess to share with anyone else. And so that is very convincing science. And so, you know, that 40 to 60 range and actually the average blood level of pregnant women in the Maasai study they did um, was about 56. And so women were actually, pregnant women were a little bit higher, which makes sense when you understand the science of the demands on the body. Um, for a pregnant woman and how much vitamin D is needed to make a healthy placenta and all the mechanisms that happen during pregnancy. So determinants of health. So this has been a really big conversation, I think, in the public health world over the last, oh, maybe 20 years. North Dakota, of course, and South Dakota, any of the states, the northern states that we have in the northern tier, have an environmental determinant of health of latitude. So we are at the latitude where six months out of the year, we cannot generate vitamin D from the sun because the ray of the sun does not hit the earth. And I think that's an education point that every medical professional really needs to understand because I've read articles from, from people that are very, very educated saying, oh, I generated vitamin D when I ran to my car in the winter because my face was exposed through my hood with my scarf on. And that's actually not true. And so one of the world's most famous vitamin D researchers is a, is a man named Dr. Grant, and he's a former NASA physicist, and he's done so much research on this. And when I started working with him about three years ago and having him mentor me, he said, well, you, you in North Dakota can't make any vitamin D, you know, during the winter. And I actually didn't know that at that time either. And so he has 
you know, been teaching me, coaching me, sending me, read all these articles. And that's how I started building my understanding of really the risk factors that we do have here. And so um, last year I measured it. It was about April 1st that the UV index got to be three or above. So the UV index, when it hits three, then we can generate vitamin D between the hours of 10 and two, roughly. Um, you cannot generate that you that ray of the sun doesn't hit the earth at the e in the evening or at such low levels you're not going to generate vitamin D. It's really that midday sun, which puts those of us who are office workers at a risk because most of the time we're not running outside to tan at noon, right? <laughs> or to sit in the sun for a few minutes. Um, but this is something that we really need to encourage in occupational health for our staff is that they go outside and take a break for a few minutes and get some sunlight on their body. And I know we women especially sometimes wear a lot of makeup that has UV protection in it. So we're not we're not even getting that exposure on our face. So we're, we're really depending on our hands and maybe a little bit of our neck. Um, to for sun exposure and it's just it's just not enough. Um, and then you have the things like inclement weather. So we have such bad weather up here that also it will drive the population indoors. So maybe even after April 1st, if we're having a long winter, it still may be so cold that people aren't spending a lot of time outside. Now you might think, well, what about people in Arizona? Actually, they just flip it because it's so hot they end up spending time indoors. So no matter where you are, um, you tend to have a little bit of determinants of health there that make a, a difference on if you can if you are outside or if you can absorb vitamin D from the sun. Now, about 15 years ago, I lived in a very, very polluted city in China, and I know that my family got very, very vitamin D deficient living there because we only had five days of blue sky in an entire year. I counted one time. And I mean, Talk about depressing. Five days of blue sky compared to growing up in North Dakota with our blue skies. It was really tough. And I didn't learn until, of course, later about that preventing the rays of the sun from hitting the earth and affecting the vitamin D levels of that population. So this is something really important for us to consider when we're looking at the risk factors for our population, because it's not the same as like populations in Beijing, for example, where they have that heavy pollution. We don't have the heavy pollution, but we have the latitude problem and we have the inclement weather issue. So that's something that we as practitioners really need to be keeping in mind. Now, individual risk factors, of course, then we move into what, how do I have different risk factors than maybe any of you? How do we all have different risk factors? So that can, of course, be things like how much sun exposure do we get? What kind of job do we have? Do we work night shifts so that we're sleeping during the day? Um, so especially your night shift workers, you really need to be doing some education with them that on their days off that they're trying to get some sun and that they need to be getting their vitamin D levels checked and perhaps that they, they might need a supplement. Looking at how are they gonna keep those levels robust. Um, you could also look at buying a UV light for your night staff that they could spend some time, you know, with the five minute timer that they could spend some time in front of the UV light um, so that they are getting some light on their skin um, when they're working night shift. Um, things like people having digestive issues, food allergies. Um, my daughter actually has food allergies and has a really tough time absorbing vitamin D. So we really have to be careful and monitor hers and make sure that she supplements and she has to intentionally tan in the summer to keep her vitamin D levels robust. Um, food and supplements, so if, and co-nutrient co -nutrient intake. If people have a largely fast food diet, they are probably missing the co-nutrients necessary to absorb and process that vitamin D into a usable format, especially if they have a very low um, magnesium diet because maybe they're just eating garbage. And frankly, this is a big issue with our teens, right? I've seen teens and children with pathetically low vitamin D. And if you interview them almost every time, they have a largely fast food diet. Chicken nuggets and fries doesn't cut it, folks. Like it doesn't have very much magnesium. And we feed our kids trash. I mean, let's be real. Everybody's doing it. And most of the times kids are only getting somewhat decent food at school. And that's not so great either. And, you know, and so this is a really big concern all the way around. I think in our long-term care settings, this is some of our best balanced meals that our people can get is because at least they have a, we have a registered dietitian or nutritionist on staff who's really trying to target feed the people some good food. And so that's a perk for long-term care residents is that a lot of times they're not so nutritionally devoid. Um, but 
even things like if people have IBS, people have any GI disorders, they're really at risk. Um, I read a study about using topical vitamin D instead of oral vitamin D for people with really severe um, GI disorders like Crohn's, and they found that this, um, the topical increased the serum 25 OHD really nicely um, because, and then it bypassed this, you know, the digestive system, which of course they have issues with absorption. So um, there are all sorts of things that you can do, tricks of the trade, to get people serum levels up a little bit if necessary. One of the things that I think is really important um, for this group of people that we're talking about today is polypharmacy. People tend to be on a lot of medications. And medications, a long list of medications can impact vitamin D absorption. And if you if you have your phone on you, snap a little picture of this article. It's free. Um, you can get this article for free online. It goes through the whole list of medications that can impact vitamin D absorption. And it's really important for us to know that. When I read that article for the first time and read through that long list, I thought, wow, is this an education need for our providers? Because how many people are prescribed these meds that are then leaching vitamin D from their body and the person is not on a supplement? So this is a really big education point for our pharmacists, for our prescribers. Um, very, very critical that we do some education on this issue. And especially if people are on multiple medications, very, very serious. Um, I was thinking about, um, you know, childbearing age women who are on um, antidepressants and it's leaching vitamin D further from their body so that then when they become pregnant, they're already in a depleted status. So very dangerous all the way around for anyone across the lifespan if they're on medications and not being um, given that supplement in vitamin D. Thank you, Carrie, for putting that article in the chat. Um, this, this is really a fun next topic to discuss because Australia became the first country in the world to have sun exposure recommendations based on skin tone. I don't know if you know this, but I, I found this out after I was reading this update of, from Australia is that the previous sun recommendations were based on really white, fair-haired Celtic skin. And so how that is really not the majority of our world and and not very representative of populations you know just in general and so i thought wow i was so impressed that here it took until 2023 for somebody to come up with a scientifically based sun exposure recommendation based on your fitzpatrick skin tone so the Fitz, fitzpatrick skin scale is up at the top there and you can kind of see you know look at your own skin where might you fit in um, but the time you need outside without sunscreen varies depending on the tone of your skin so you know if you're really in that red hair freckles very pale skin you might just need five minutes um, and have to acclimate yourself to 15 minutes before, you know, from spring to summer so that you don't burn, right? But you need this full spectrum sun on your body because it generates many more nutrients than vitamin D. That's just one of the ones we happen to know about. And so we really do need that healthy sun exposure. And then of course, moving forward to our darkest of skin tones, people may, may need up to an hour and a half to generate the same amount of vitamin D that someone else would in 10 minutes. 10 minutes, hour and a half, 10 minutes. So you can see it so varies, but this it really relates to health disparities of people who are ancestrally from around the equator, but are living in Northern latitudes. And so if you actually, there's several studies done looking at individuals that are um, darker tone ethnicities that are living in Northern climates and the extreme vitamin D deficiency that they that that happens and the health consequences of that is very serious. And so this is one of the conversations I would be having tomorrow, um, compare, comparing serum levels of Caucasian versus non-Caucasian women in North Dakota. Um, so very, very serious um, things to be thinking about and to be educating our providers about. Now, special population risk factors, of course, that's this group that we're talking about today. So we're talking about nursing home residents. And, you know, clearly one of the reasons that people are at risk is because they're living in a group facility where they're maybe not um, have the ability to take themselves outside or um, time for the staff to take them outside. And so they're not, they're just not getting the sun exposure they need. I think if my grandmother, when she was living in long-term care, 
number one, the exit that anybody could go in was quite far from her unit and she wasn't capable of taking herself outside. So unless somebody had time to take her outside, she wasn't getting outside. And, you know, I mean, that's just the way it is, right? When I was an aide, you know, only in the afternoon, sometimes if other residents were sleeping, did the residents who weren't sleeping, did we have time to take them outside? And, and it wasn't, and, and it depended on a lot of things. How was the weather? Was it windy? I mean, was the sun too hot? You know, I mean, all the things that it, it requires for us to take people outside. Um, but it's very different. You know, if you think back to um, even 100 years ago in healthcare, there was a big garden or a solarium for almost every hospital and every home that um, that housed people. And people spent time in the garden. And we just don't do that as much anymore. It's just not part of our healthcare system. I mean, if I look at the hospitals in my community, nobody has a big garden where they're taking patients outside. I mean, for safety, of course, all the windows are locked. You can't even open the windows, you know, and get fresh air. So things things are really different. And then on top of that, we have natural changes in the body um, that happen to digestive health. So it, you know, decreases in our absorption from food and supplements, and also even changes in the skin so that it's not as easily um, absorbed and converted into a usable form the older when the older people become and how they age. And then I already mentioned before the multiple medication use as being very common. So these are things that really can affect this population um, and be a big risk. So I want to take a minute and address some concerns. Um, Carrie, if you want to snip, if you if you can snip, I don't know if you can do this um, blog and pop it in the chat. There's a really great blog um, that is by some vitamin D researchers at Grassroots Health Nutrient Research Institute. They've been since 20, uh, 2007. They are they do have the largest vitamin D study in the world. Um, Forty a uh, panel of forty eight vitamin D scientists that. Um, are together contributing, uh, collaborating on research, talking about research. Um, their evidence-based blog is literally one of the best things out there. They cite new articles all the time, discuss the article, put up charts of the article, make them easy read so that you don't have to download the PubMed article and read the whole thing if you don't want to. Um, but very but very good organization. So just I mentioned about the toxicity before. Um, is that toxicity is considered over 200. So I, I often have people to say, oh, I was toxic. And I say, well, what was your level? Oh, I was 60. That's not considered toxic. Toxic is over 200. And we, of course, don't want people to be getting up in that level, but we also don't want people to be underdosed either. And so I'd say, oh, you know, you know, vitamin D scientists in the literature generally regarded as safe is between, we really want people between 30 and 100. Um, but of course, you know, monitoring so that we're not going over that. And it's it's a simple blood test. It's not hard. We can monitor our vitamin D levels just like we monitor anything else and make sure that we're in the range that we want to be. And what I found over the years of going through this process um, with my family is that everybody kind of tends to have a sweet spot. And if you're, is that if you take the same, if you kind of know what you need to take to stay in the range you're in, typically it'll stay about the same. And so, you know, like my daughter takes 5,000 units a day and she stays about 40. So that's where she she's fine staying that way. And she just doesn't want to take more than that. And doesn't want to, have to take more than one pill. So she just stays right at 40 by taking 5,000. Um, there's an article by McCullough. Um, and it's they says you know, that article was an inpatient article in a hospital where they gen everybody that walks through their doors gets 10,000 units a day. And they've been doing that for years, and he, and I've talked to him personally. They've had zero issues with giving every absolutely everybody who walks through their doors ten thousand a day. They've never had any issues. Um, kidney stones. So this is also a common question that people have. Um, there's actually a really good blog on the Grassroots Health website about that kidney stones are not associated with um, higher vitamin D levels. They're actually associated with vitamin D deficiency, which is really interesting because that's kind of the opposite of what people think. But the literature is very clear on this issue and you can go in and read it all. And so it's it's not associated. OK, another common question I get is about um, research. So people will say, oh, Dr. Stanford, the research is all over the board. You know, it, it doesn't really make sense. Some will say it's good. Some will say it's not good. And um, I asked this question to Dr. Grant one of the first times that I visited with him. And I said, Dr. Grant, what's the deal with the vitamin D literature? 
you know, I had read a lot of it by that point, And I said, man, it's just all over the place. And he said, it's about how the studies are designed. So in 2014, a vitamin D researcher named Dr. Haney created the criteria of nutrient study design. And one of the things that he said was we can't treat nutrients. And so that is magnesium, zinc, anything we're setting that is a nutrient, the same as we would treat a drug. So in a, a drug study, for example, we can give somebody 25 milligrams of something and we know that's the only source that they are getting that from because the body doesn't naturally make that drug. It isn't available in food, but it's different for nutrients. We get things from food. We get things from the sun. Um, and so you can't do the same study design. You actually have to look at a biological marker. Like for vitamin D, we do serum concentrations. That's the only we, that's the only way that if you do pre and post serum concentrations that you can have an assessment and then look at your outcomes. So that's about study design, right? And so I actually do a whole separate webinar on how to read vitamin D research. And so if anybody's interested in that, I can bore you with that all day long, but I'll I won't keep going on that today. But just to say there is a great blog on the on the Grassroots Health website about that. They have ample literature about that and they have the studies that are examples. And if you read the studies by serum concentration, you'll get a completely different um, result of the study. Then if you look at the two groups, like one that was given 400, I use for example, and one that was given 4,000. And so that is something to really think about. And after I really learned how to read vitamin D research, um, I, I became even more convinced about how solid the research was. Now, I know this isn't really the target group to talk about breast cancer, but I really can't talk about vitamin D without talking about breast cancer. So my family has both premenopausal breast cancer in um, my cousins and postmenopausal breast cancer. So big, hot topic among the women in my extended family. And the day that I read the study that showed an 83% lower breast cancer risk for women that have a blood level above 60 versus lower than 20, I cried because I was a hospice nurse. I buried women who died from breast cancer. And when I looked at that research and I looked up every article in the reference list, and then I started reading all the literature about breast cancer and vitamin D, my heart was just broken. And I don't think, we don't wanna have a woman in our lives that does not know this, right? We need to get outside, we need to get in the sun, we need to know our own personal vitamin D number because it's different for everyone. And we need to make sure that we have a robust level. Because I tell you what, I don't want to walk, I don't want to see any woman walking around who doesn't know this information, but I can't tell everyone, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I like to talk, but I can't talk that much. And so everybody needs to take some responsibility and share with the women in their life and, you know, share with the women in your office, you know, get something going together in your community groups where you share this information because it can literally save someone's life. And there's so much science. It's so good. It's all available. Grassroots Health was founded by a breast cancer survivor who found this research. And so she's very passionate about it, lots of information about it. Now, falls. This is a big issue of concern um, in, in long-term care. So a couple things about this. Low, to, low vitamin D level. So that is typically very low in the literature. Some of this research on vitamin D in falls is very is old. Um, it's an independent predictor of fall risk. And I think most people know that. Most people know this research. This is why people in the nursing home are at least on 400 IUs or 800, because people have heard about this. You know, this is 20, 20 year old research already. But what people don't know um, is that some places are not giving it with what the literature recommends. So the literature recommends daily dosing for vitamin D, not monthly dosing. What happens when you give monthly dosing is it'll jack up the vitamin D really high. The enzymes will come in and degrade it really fast. And then the enzymes linger around for a while and will go destroy vitamin D in other parts of the body, like in the intracellular area, for example. And it will actually cause rebound um, vitamin D deficiency that's even lower. I actually had a nurse practitioner who'd attended one of my lectures call me and say, why are my patients lower than they were before? <laughs> and I said, you're giving a monthly shot, aren't you? And she said, how did you know? And I said, well, because of this. So I told her this and I said, you, you know, the longest or the really the shortest time frame you can do is a weekly. Um, you could do a weekly supplement, weekly injection, 
but you really, you can't do monthly. You just can't. I mean, no vitamin D scientist recommends monthly. And, but it's really best for it to be that consistent daily dosing like you're out in the sun because then the body can use it and knows what to do with it. And it's just that methodical supplementation. Now, if you're like me and you tend to be a little bit forgetful, here's my personal tip. Get a clear little small container, like a clear cooking dish or something that's small. Put all your vitamin D, if it's, this is if you don't have little kids in the house, put all your vitamin D gels in it and put it right somewhere where the sun can shine through it so it looks all pretty like little pearls. And then you'll, you'll say, oh, look at those pretty little things. Boop, and then you'll remember to take one. That was literally my personal trick that I had to use to take it every day. Otherwise, I would forget. If I had to put it in the cupboard, I would have to pull it out and I'd forget. But for some reason, the pretty little pearls just would catch my eye by the sink and I would take one. And I didn't put it by my toothbrush. I put it by my sink downstairs. So that's my tip. And also take it in the morning, not at night, because I have found with myself, for some reason, it will keep me awake. I don't know why, but it keeps me awake. Um, as far as falls, monthly dosing is um, associated with an increased risk of falls. So very important in long-term care that we are not doing monthly dosing. So daily or weekly is really um, the best. Now, I want to pop in here and just quickly talk about mortality rates because this is something that, of course, we care about, right? Um, we want our people to have a happy, healthy life. And generally, vitamin D level is associated with mortality rates. And that we can find that very easily in the literature by reading some of Dr. Grant's articles, Dr. William Grant. Um, but this, this is a brand new study on 28-day mortality rates among ICU patients that just came out in the last couple months, and I thought it was really relevant. Um, so it was 236 patients in seven different ICUs in three hospitals. The average age of the patients was quite low, um, but what they did is they drew the vitamin D levels within 24 hours of admission, and what they found, 69% of the patients were had levels below 20 Okay, which is not uncommon because anytime there's illness or um, trauma, the body uses vitamin D really rapidly to heal. So people's levels can go down really quickly in a very short amount of time. But you can see here, there's almost a five-fold um, mortality rate between people who have a sufficient vitamin D level versus people that are deficient. And that is, that's really high. <laughs> so this is, this is 28 days if they're going to be alive or dead at that point, significantly associated with vitamin D status here. So th this is a very this is a very good study for us, and um, very positive to be thinking about in terms of the health of our people. Now this actually correlates very well to a study that was done almost 10 years ago um, in the VA, um, where. I, I brought in this chart because I thought it was so important. And excuse me, I have to look on my glasses because my computer is so small here. But if we look down to where really the big dip is, you can see 40. So 40 is kind of where the scientists recommend as the starting point here. And 60 is kind of where the range, but you can see about 50, which is the midpoint, you know, all, whoops, even 52 maybe, you see the another little dip down. Right. So if you're going to have your maximum, um, your maximum protection against hospital acquired infections, which is what this study is, it's going to be right at about that 50 to 55 mark. And that that is really significant. And I, we I use this study um, to talk a facility into doing a quality improvement project, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So this pertains to your population because talking about skin breakdown and prevention of skin breakdown and healing. And so because of the information that I just showed you about the hospital acquired infections, the 28 day mortality rate, I was able to talk a hospital into doing a quality improvement project in North Dakota. And we've been doing it for a year. We just hit the year mark and I'm so excited. We're gonna start our data analysis, but we can already tell some of the trends the wounds, I'm telling you what, have just went and healed right up because our goal was to get everybody to hit 50. And so I had learned this from a PhD nurse who was doing some research down in Texas. And I had said, okay, like, do you think we should target 40? Like, what are your thoughts? She's like, oh no, 
and I can't even do my best imitation of her Texas accent, but 50, she's like, go for 50. 50 is the magic number. You hit 50 and these wounds are just going to heal right up just super fast. And that is also what we've seen. We're so excited to start gathering this data, analyzing it, and to be disseminating the data. And I'll tell you what, I will be doing some work to get this to be published because it was so fun to do and to do it as a local project. And I tell you what, it was absolutely pathetic, the vitamin D levels that we saw of the patients on admission. Absolutely pathetic, like frighteningly low. And this, this hospital wasn't the first place that these patients had been. So for the most part, no one had been checking their vitamin D. So that's a note to us, a quality improvement project that we can have as a whole state is, are we checking our people's vitamin D levels when they're coming into our facility so that we're, we're giving the body the fuel it needs to protect itself from inflammation and promote healing? So one of the things that they did in this, this project was they used an evidence-based vitamin D calculator. So they we, we drew the patient's vitamin D level, and then we used the calculator to calculate an appropriate loading dose and a maintenance dose for the patient to quickly get up to the 50 nanograms per mil mark. So we actually used some um, kind of newer uh, technology to help us to get there, and I'll show you how to find that and use it for free later on. So the other part of this study did, we had several metrics that we were looking at and following um, their catheter and their catheter associated UTIs was one of the metrics that we followed and also a huge decrease in their CODIs. So fun. They're so excited about it. They're like, oh my goodness, like we actually had a huge decrease in our CODIs this year. So this is about infection, right? is that vitamin D helps the body to be more resilient against infection. So very fun to see that research come to practice and have it benefit our patient outcomes right here in our state. So I know this is some of the things that people have been looking at weighted for bated breath here. What's the word on what does vitamin D do with COVID? If you are looking at the internet right now, literally there is something every single day about vitamin D. And you know what? For a reason, our first evidence that vitamin D was effective to help prevent um, COVID infection was way back in 2021. Um, actually, in 2020, the vitamin D scientists of the world got together and wrote an article that was published like in May, maybe, or April of 2020 and said, hey, like, hello, start giving everyone vitamin D really quick. And of course, nobody did it. But the places that did saw much less um, infection among their people. And so really fun to see 46 percent um, well, I shouldn't say it that way. The risk of infection was 46% higher if you had were deficient of vitamin D. Your risk of severe infection was 90% higher. Look at this. That's what this is. Look at this, the Whopper 90 there. And then the risk of death was 107% higher. So the verdict is out. Vitamin D is involved in immune system and resilience and infection fighting. And guess what? We've known it for many, many, many years. They've been studying vitamin D for 100 years. This is not new news. I don't know why the scientific world acts like it's new news. It's not new news. Um, if you look at 100 years ago when people were sick, they brought them outside and made them sunbathe. Anybody ever seen pictures of people with tuberculosis in, these, in Switzerland tanning out on sunbeds? Yeah, because guess what? It helps the body get their immune system working to fight infections. This is, this is not new news. So yes, yay. It's nice to have something that is effective. So it's great. Okay, another thing, again, this same doctor um, from Boston University, again, look at the Marcus 50. This shows COVID deaths in 22 now. You can see all the little blue tick marks. I know it's probably kind of small for you guys, but all the little blue tick marks are all the deaths. And you can see about 50, Above, if people had a blood level above 50, they were much less likely to die from COVID. I mean, significantly so. Look at this solid line after 30. I mean, I look at this diagram, I wouldn't even want to have a level of under 30. And look at under 20, look at under 10. It's literally solid blue line. I mean, the, these charts are just so, just so impressive to me. And of course, it's not just COVID deaths, it's other um, respiratory infections as well. 
Um, OK, I want to transition quick outside of that into cognitive and mental health, because I think this information is really interesting and it benefits not just your residents, but your staff too. Like I said, if our if our staff are a little happier, our residents are happy too because they can feel the more positive energy, right? And so I want to share a little bit about this. So the neurocognitive diseases that are associated with vitamin, low vitamin D, the list is so long. Like look at this list on the right, some big whopping things, right? Alzheimer's disease, dementia, cognitive decline, Parkinson's, depression, anxiety, seasonal affective disorder, schizophrenia, autism and ADHD, migraines, multiple sclerosis, impulsive and addictive behaviors, sleep disorders and suicide. Wow, that's a whopping big long list. It's all in the literature. Every time I read one of these articles, every time I'm like, can how can we get this information out faster? Um, but it's so good. And it's not just the associated with, it is actually looking and reading at the pathophysiology of what vitamin D does to the cell. And that what that's what makes me really excited because you know what, you can't argue with that. If I can't argue with how vitamin D works in the body, right? This is how it works in the cell. And when you think about even small things of how, if I have low vitamin D levels, my stress response doesn't work right. And my body can't regulate if cortisol starts to go up. So guess, you know what that means? Those of you who are in HR, if anybody's in HR, when your employees are a little chippy with each other, guess what? Better for them to have high vitamin D. They're not going to be as chippy with each other. You know, and I think about this even in, in my, my house with my family. Um, when I got my college kids on vitamin D, I could see them being less stressed from their work or from their school work at school. You know, I felt like they were just better able to tolerate. And when I asked them, like, how are you doing? Do you, how do you feel like your stress response is? I mean, just their verbal responses of, yeah, you know what? I feel like I'm I'm managing everything okay. You know, and the literature is just so robust talking about how vitamin D works in the brain. Um, the Brain Institute in Australia has studied this for over 20 years. Like they have so much good literature about it. It's great. But look at these things, these words that you're probably familiar with. Dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine. These are all neurotransmitters that help regulate our mood and how we think. And so, you know what, us making good decisions, us having, um, us being able to feel joy, all these things are related to vitamin D plays a role in how those neurotransmitters work in the body. So I, I love it. And I have been collecting articles for about a year to write an article on mental health. Um, it's kind of my next baby project after I get this stuff done with our um, childbearing one. Um, but all these things are so interesting. Okay, so look, I don't know if you can read these little things. I know they're small, but impaired stress response, impulsive behavior, hello, teenagers. Um, impaired focus, again, look at our school age kids. Man, a kindergartner has impaired focus. We wanna throw them on drugs. Hey, has somebody checked their vitamin D level first? I mean, what a novel thought, right? Um, impaired memory. Now, I really saw this with my nursing students because they're trying to pull in a lot of new information. And I had a student who said, you know what, Dr. Sanford, after hearing your lecture, I went and got my vitamin D level checked. And it was only 12. And you know what? I hadn't told anybody um, that I had been having suicidal ideation. And after three months, the student came back and said, you know what? Um, I, not only can I, is my suicidal ideation completely gone, I'm retaining what I'm learning and I'm passing my exams easier. Like I can remember my recall is better and I can remember what I'm studying. I mean, that's just so exciting. So then it made me think about nurses, okay? I tell you what, I told my students, if I'm in the ER, I tell you what, I'm gonna be open in one eye and I'm gonna say, listen, are you taking your vitamin D? I don't, I don't even know if I want you to be touching me if you're not, right? Because who's gonna say you're gonna be able to make a good decision? I want nurses who can make good decisions. I don't know anybody, any of you, but when they're putting meds in my IV line, I want to make sure that they are present and can process the decisions they're making that day. So really important um, for all of our healthcare professionals. We are making decisions that affect people's lives and we need to be at our best too and make sure that our markers are in a healthy range. Um, but even think about things like impaired memory. You know, my parents are close to 80 and I always say to them, hey, are you taking your vitamin D? Because otherwise you're gonna think that you're getting senile and maybe you're just having low vitamin D. <laughs> so they're so sick of me taking it, but they're saying that all the time. Um, and then psychosis. 
So this was really interesting to me because I ended up having to take over mental health clinical after we had a faculty change. And, and I was thinking about how the brain works one day and I thought, I wonder if vitamin D deficiency is related to increased psychosis. So then of course, you know, me and my love relationship with PubMed, guess what? Yes, it is related to psychotic behaviors. So, and a decrease in psychotic behaviors for people who have um, appropriate, you know, robust levels of vitamin D. Um, executive function, information processing speed, um, increased anger. There was a study of a million and a half children in Iran where they found they found out if they supplemented them, they checked what behaviors were down in the school and anger was one of them. And I thought, how important for our children, how important for all of us, how important for us when we have teenagers at home, you know, that we want to be able um, to keep control of our emotions. Um, the suicide one I'm going to address on a separate slide, but again, even things like decreased cognition and addictive behaviors, depression, anxiety, all related to uh, low vitamin D. So bottom line is this, our brain needs vitamin D and the form that the vitamin that the brain uses is uh, 25 OHD3. And so there's higher concentrations of D3 are associated with a lower risk of dying from dementia or cognitive impairment. Very important information and increase in global, um, global cognitive functioning scores if people have higher vitamin D levels and a slower rate of cognitive decline. And I, I love the better working memory that those things are really important to the health and to the well-being of our um, of our residents. Um, so this this is kind of the uh, main study that that information came from from Shea, but it wasn't from an Alzheimer's and aging project. And, and they found that, like I said, 25 to 33 percent of people, um, if you have higher concentrations, you have a lower risk of dying. Um, from dementia or with cognitive impairment. All right, and look at this chart. I think this is again so so interesting. Um, I put a couple different authors of um, articles that you can read. Chai and Fiert um, both both found that below 20 nanograms per mil, people have an increased risk of um, having Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And that's just like looking at 20 as a marker. You know, like this, because these were a little earlier, if we did more of a staggered research where we were looking at less than 10, less than 20, less than 30, and less than 40 or 40 and above, I think we'd see a really nice inverse relationship there. They just are looking at one cutoff marker of 20. And that's, you know, that's the problem with some of the researchers because it's only using one marker to discuss and you don't have access to the whole data set to look at the whole if there's a trend line. Um, but both of these articles are very good, almost triple the risk of Alzheimer's in people who have vitamin D levels less than 20. So if any of you have Alzheimer's in your family. Something really um, to be thinking about is where are you at with your sun exposure and um, your vitamin D levels and what, maybe are you needing a supplement? Vitamin D and mental health. I can't even tell you how much literature there is on this topic. It is very good. There are studies that, are sh that show there's no association, but if you go in and look at the study, they use the dose of an infant, okay? No adult taking 400 IUs that's like spitting in a bucket for an adult. It's not going to make any difference and it makes for poor research. And when those things are published, it makes it look like it's not effective. And so if people are going to be citing research, they really need to go in and look at the study and read the whole thing. And so this is why, like I said, one of my favorite hobbies is reading articles because I read the whole thing. I read the whole thing. I look at it. I analyze it. I send it to grassroots and say, hey, this might be a good blog or look at this one, look at this error. And then sometimes one of the senior scientists will write a rebuttal and say, hey, you can you, you should look at this, 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 because it really, it really does matter how the study does, are designed. Um, lots of literature out there about vitamin D and a direct correlation to depression and anxiety. So this, this is a slide looking at overall well-being, and you can see how um, 
it might be a little small here for you, but when you get the slides, you can look at it a little closer. As the vitamin D levels go up from 40, the, the perceived health and well being scores really increase. And they're still pretty low if people are down in the 20. People don't perceive that their mental health is good. And so this is about perception and emotional wellness. Um, some really good literature out there. There's a pretty new study about behavioral disorders in older adults that I thought might be interesting for this group. And especially because when I was an aide, you know, there were times, unfortunately, when I was the recipient of some aggression. Right. And so we know that when people are, are getting confused or if people are frightened, people can act out, people can be agitated, people can be aggressive. But vitamin D deficiency is associated with more, more severe subscores of agitation and aggression. So this is really important um, to think about in that, that aspect of your residence, too, especially if people are feeling overly agitated or if you have a resident that's aggressive, you know, if let's say, for example, they're on a psych medication that's leaching additional vitamin D from their body, how more important for them to be taking vitamin D when vitamin D is associated with aggression? So you can see we really need to know what meds we're giving our people if they could potentially be leaching from them and then making sure to keep those um, vitamin D levels. This study actually, they really had a low marker. Um, they were actually looking at levels below 10 or above 10. That's actually too low, but that's because their concentration of their participants was so low. So they didn't even have healthy level participants to compare to. Do you know what I'm saying? Everybody was low. So this is really, this is not great. All right, suicide and vitamin D, very serious very serious issue. Both in North Dakota and South Dakota, we are among the highest in the nation, especially for teenagers, for adolescent death by suicide. And so again, very, very associated with vitamin D levels. This 2023 study by Levine is, actually, is absolutely phenomenal and shows a decreased risk um, for our people of color um, because again, they need more time to um, in the sun to generate that vitamin D. Really, this is part of a very important conversation in the state in the states that we need to be having in an upper level is in our suicide review, are we drawing vitamin D levels of our people that have had death by suicide? And we are not in North Dakota. I don't know about South Dakota, but we are not in North Dakota. And this is an easy thing that we can do to see if this is a factor. And also people coming into emergency rooms with suicidal ideation are we tracking vitamin D levels of those people? Because previous research from this same group in the VA shows that yes, people who have blood levels of between 15 and 18 have higher suicidal ideation than people where it's 20 or above. So again, that below 20 mark is where you have that increase in suicidal ideation and impulsivity, which is the factor of people a lot of times if they try to harm themselves. So very important things to consider. This study on opioid addiction is really one of my favorites to talk about because nobody is talking about avenues to prevent addiction. They talk about what to do after you're addicted. We maybe talk about, oh, support systems and having friends and things like that that will keep us from being addicted, but we don't talk about anything um, in the body physiologically, but guess what? This shows a 47% lower chance of an opioid use if people have um, levels above 20 versus lower than 20. That's that's phenomenal. And that's just if they're 20. What if people have a level of 40? I mean, is it going to be 80%, 90% less chance of being addicted to opioids? I mean, this is where my research mind says, wow, this is something we really need to pursue. And the authors say this could be prevention for opioid addiction. Boom. Tell me what are they saying is prevention for opioid addiction? It's actually involved in the opioid addiction cycle in the brain. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, I think it's really fascinating. That's why I bring this up all the time, because I think nobody's talking about this. How are we going to prevent these things? All right, so I just want to share a little bit 
Of course, my favorite grassroots health nutrient research institute, they supported me so much on my doctoral research and have supported me with the community health project we're doing for vitamin D here in North Dakota. Um, on their website is the North Dakota project. You can go click on it and you can see some of the latest results. Um, and there's just so much information out there, so many resources. Um, the we have the vitamin D calculator that I mentioned on there. We have the vitamin D quiz, which is the quiz you can take to show if you are high, medium, or low risk for vitamin D deficiency. I was part of the team that made that. You can take this e-course. Um, if you just type in e-course on their website, it'll take you to this class that you can take and you can get the continuing education units. Um, I, I made that class as part of my doctoral work. And a lot of these resources we made as part of my doctoral work because I told them we got to get this information to the hands of the people who are making the decisions. If it sits in PubMed, it isn't going to help anybody. So we got to get it moved over and get it in use. So just a few recommendations here as we're wrapping up the last few minutes. I know we're about over time already, um, but I really recommend that you try to do some type of vitamin D quality improvement project in your own facility. So what would that look like? Or maybe even just in your work setting, if everybody does their own levels and if everybody says, OK, we're going to take it for three months, how does everybody feel, even just among your colleagues, and then measure in three months, right? But you could do this. You could do a quality improvement project like the facility that I'm working in right now. You could do things like wound healing. You could look at cotties. You could do behaviors. You could look at um, what type of PRN psych medication you're having to give out. You could do staff sick days. I could give you a million ideas on what a design for a quality improvement project. And if you want help, I'm thrilled to help you. Um, staff education, I'm super passionate about. If we can keep our staff healthy, it'll keep our residents healthy too. Um, and then let's disseminate our findings. If you do something, talk about it. If you need, if you need help on how to write it up into something small, I'll help you. We'll find a place for you to publish it. I mean, it's it's just fun to share things that work that impact the lives of our people in our states. We have to we have to be the ones who take charge of this and do it. Nobody else is going to do it for us, right? I mean, we are the ones who have to take this science and put it into practice in our states. So just in summary, if you implement these things, the expectation is that you're going to have better health outcomes for your residents and for your staff. That's really what it comes down to. You know, you can all take part, all make a difference. Um, I think I'll just end right there. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer as best I can. Yes, please. If you do have a question, either put it in the chat or there's a questions Q&A um, feature at the top of your screen. Uh, we do have a question. It says, in the research you've done, do you find things that commonly deplete vitamin D, such as soda or, or diet soda or anything like that? You know what? I actually haven't looked on that. I will write that down and I will I will do that because I know that there are a lot of medications too. So likely there are other substances that deplete as well. But I will I will look that up because probably there's some other chemicals that are in our daily life maybe that we're ingesting that could take it too. Absolutely. Um, again, you can take yourself off mute as well and ask um, Dr. Sanford a question. Um, you can put it into the chat. You can put it into the Q&A um, spot at the top of your screen. Um, there was a question about the slides being available. Um, yes, the Great Plains Quinn team will share the slides and the recording um, to all registrants um, sometime probably later this week. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. My question is, what about um, non cauties no catheters um but high uti rates does vitamin yeah. d have effect on that because it seems to me the same people get in my facility um keep getting utis and I mean, they're consistently like every other month so i mean I think we, you know, we know that there's, of course, a lot of things that can put someone at risk for having a UTI, but this is one thing that can help support that because it will just help it support from the microbial level, right? That they're not as right. vulnerable to infection. I mean, there's some things that are just a struggle, you know, especially with this age group, you know, if people are able to appropriately clean themselves and things. But remember, it's one factor, right? We're trying to get the low hanging fruit here, you know? Right. I hear you. 
Thank you. Yeah. I don't see any other questions, Jennifer. I'll, I guess, is there anything you want to add? Otherwise, we can close out today's session with some final comments from our end. No, just thank you so much, Beth, for sharing again. You're always so interesting to listen to. Thanks yes, you exude passion for this topic, which is infectious. So I, I literally was making notes like, how much vitamin D do I need to put in my white skinned body? So thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so as we close out today, just a reminder that all of you will get a certificate of attendance that you can submit to your accrediting bodies for continuing education if, if that's feasible. We are an approved provider of continuing education with the North Dakota Board of Examiners for Nursing Home Administrator and the South Dakota Board of Nursing Home Administrators. Uh, I believe, oh, Kelsey just added the link to the evaluation into the chat. If you have, you know, one to two minutes and you can provide us feedback, we will sh be sure to use that feedback as we plan future events. And we will also share your comments and questions with Dr. Sanford. Um, and we will, again, send the re uh, recording and the slides to all of um, you sometime um, by the end of the week, and we will post them on our website. Again, thank you to the Great Plains Quinn team for bringing this topic um, today um, forward and to Dr. Sanford for your excellent presentation on a really timely and important topic. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a great day. Thank you.